I was five the first time that I received some disgusting anti-Asian hateful racism. So, you know, and how young is too young to teach our kids about racism? Like nobody asked us how early it was to receive all this hatred and abuse. So. Thank you for joining us for another episode of On the Horizon, a podcast about what's on the horizon for sex workers and how to navigate it. I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual and at jessiesage.com. And I am Melrose Michaels, and you can find me at Melrose Michaels on social and at melrosemichaels.com. Also, just as a reminder, if you're joining the podcast um, on Apple, please leave us a five-star rating and review us. It really helps us grow as a podcast and better share information from our guests to the sex work community as a whole. Absolutely. And last but not least, if you want to support the podcast, please go to anchor.fm forward slash horizon spelled W-H-O-R-I-Z-O-N to become a premium subscriber on the podcast, which unlocks you two bonus episodes each month on the 8th and 22nd between our regularly scheduled episodes. And we'll give you access to tons of exclusive footage of ourselves and our guests. Loomis is free and affordable ads and social networks without the anti-sex work rhetoric. Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists from Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising and social spaces to the sex work community. They also give back to organizations based in harm reduction, sex work, and education. Stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms, their two products, Tris.link and Switter.at, are refreshing and well-needed changes in both presentation and mission. Both are free to join and open to all. In the words of an A4 user, from the policies to the language to the advice and tips, it makes such a big difference to feel encouraged and supported instead of policed. Check out their website, assembly4.com, for the word, not the number, for more info. Today, we are going to be discussing race and gender with Ember Fiera, King Noir, and Dulciana Beatrix. Mm -hmm. So we're both white women, white cis women. So uh, we're just going to let people who should be talking about this talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. Although I do want to say, like, before we let them talk, yeah, shut up, white woman. You have not much to say. No, um, I I do want to say, though, that I feel like one of the things, the only real thing that we can contribute to this, Yeah. the only thing of value that we can contribute to this is to say that like we do recognize that we're also part of the problem we recognize that we're existing in a racist uh culture we recognize that we um benefit from racism we recognize we like we recognize as much of that as is possible for us to recognize and we realize that there is so much that we're not recognizing that we need to and we are very open to um being educated to being educated and being critiqued and i feel like that's all we can do is say like we know we're a part of the problem we made mistakes even in like how we even in this episode (laughs) we make mistakes even in this episode we can't speak for all white people but we can say that we do recognize that we're like part of the problem and we do think that we um we don't think it's the job of um people of color to explain to us why we're the problem but we appreciate um the time that um that all three of these guests gave us talking about their experiences Ember Fiera is a porn actress, dancer, and video performance artist living in Los Angeles, California. As an Asian transgender woman, she has always found people to be fascinated at her body as a site of desire, intrigue, and possibilities. She also loves the trans and sex worker communities. You can find her at Minivids and Twitter at Ember Fiera. So welcome, <laughs> Ember, to the show. We're so glad to have you. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Do you want to tell um, our audience a little bit about you and your background and what you do? Yeah. Um, so my name's Ember Fiera. Um, I just recently started getting into porn. Um, so I I feel like the whole pandemic, I was like, I should do OnlyFans. I'm going to do OnlyFans. And then like <laughs> I started doing OnlyFans and then they're like, no, don't do sex work on OnlyFans. And I was like, oh, shoot. So now right now I'm on many vids. Uh, I'm getting okay. like my bearings on that one. I'll probably go back to OnlyFans and try to do some stuff. Um, I just did like my first professional shoot with Crash pod which is a really cool oh, um cool. yeah queer independent porn mm-hmm. studio and um i'm so excited for that one to come out like the footage was beautiful um Did you up to san francisco for that? yeah yeah i went up to san francisco oh, for that it was yeah. it was so great um 
yeah, so it was such a wonderful experience. Um, I I feel like I I've been like nervous to do porn, and that was just like the perfect first experience. Um, mm-hmm. All the directors were great. Um, my scene partner was great. We've worked together quite a few times, so it was just yeah, really nice. Do you um, know Fresh Pad series? Mm-hmm. No, I'm not familiar. Oh, so it's this. It's in San Francisco. It's been running for like. 20 years like a long time it's been going for a really long Mm -hmm. time and what it basically is shine louise Louise houston runs it but they want it to be like how you would have sex with people that you want to have sex with so the idea of the crash pad is like they give you a key you go in you have sex with your scene partner the way you want to and shine louise louise houston like films it but it's all like queer people having queer sex yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's that's genius too wow (laughs) Very cool. So it's like the same setting and then everybody brings their own their own thing. Their own thing. That's great. Yeah. 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 And I, I really liked how they weren't like, okay, you gotta do this and then do this and do this. Or just like, you know, just enjoy yourself and just, you know, have fun with it. And yeah, so <laughs> so fun. Um yeah. that's where I'm at currently in my life. Um, what I'm doing. Um, I mean, I've been involved in sex work for a long time. I mean, I've I've probably done it. Um, if you if you can think about it, I've probably been there, dabbled a little bit. Um, I think I first got involved. I mean, I, I would say I first got involved, like kind of sugary. I, you know, I had like a YouTube channel, and I was like, "Hi, I'm trans," and this was like before there was like a lot of trans people. Not that there's like a mm. lot of trans people online, but I was like really like one of the first on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And oh, wow, really? That's yeah, funny. I mean, I, I, I'm not to show my age, but it's, yeah, I've been around. <laughs> I've been around. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, that, you know, that was, that was interesting. Um, and then, you know, people started giving me money. And then I was like, oh, I, I guess this was like sugaring, I guess. Um, and then I started <laughs> uh, dancing. I uh, was like an exotic dancer, or I, I guess that was a term I was using. I don't know if I really started like that term anymore but um yeah i was a stripper <laughs> i was a stripper and uh, <laughs> um that was um i i loved that um i love dancing um so i i really loved that um yeah and then i just i've done different types of sex work it's allowed me to like travel it's allowed me to um yeah. be independent um honestly i keep trying to like get like a nice civvy job and like i try it i'm like oh this is horrible this, this <laughs> <sucks."> like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know i mean st- I, I would love stability in my life like that's the one thing i would say like i, I really just don't have you know it's like, i don't i don't know what i'm doing next month it's hard for me to like plan mm-hmm. you know yeah. whatever is going on but it's like I don't know, just civic job, it can be so, so crushing and just so like, you know, not, not just, you know, they just suck period. Right. But then also, you know, being trans, like also being Asian, like also like, it's just like, sometimes I'm just like, I'm so mad and you can't say anything, you know, and you, yeah. and you don't get to leave, you know, and you're just like, oh, and then it's like, this is just a minimum wage. Like, why am I doing this? Like, uh, yeah. so, yeah, um, so let's- like, let's talk about that because, like, you're bringing up the fact that, like, you're Asian and you're trans. And so mm-hmm. you have these, like, m- like, you know, issues of, like, race and gender, like, marginalized mm-hmm. identities in terms of both race and gender. And mm-hmm. one of the things that um, we talked to you about, like, before we started rolling was, um, like, talking about that intersection. And you were like, actually, let's talk about intersectionality. So I was curious, like, um, if we could kind of start there and say, like, okay, you you're coming at this work, not just, not just sex work, but all your work, like mm-hmm. as an Asian trans woman, how does that impact your experiences? But let's kind of talk about intersectionality first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think um, intersectionality, um, I mean, the way it was taught to me when, you know, I was taking like a, a feminist class, you know, mm-hmm. um, from Kimberly, Kimber, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it was like a way to like, look at policies, look at how, you know, like, you know, we can't just say like, oh, like this identity, you know, and this identity, right? And that she was specifically looking at how black women, you know, the mm-hmm. intersection between those two identities, you know, you can't yeah. just help black people, you know, or just black men, and you can't just help women that you have to be like, oh, we have to look at, you know, people falling in between both of those cracks. Right. Um, and I, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense, you know, when we're looking at policies, we're discussing that, like, we have to keep talking about the intersectionality. And then I think I see, you know, when we look at our movements, you know, 
I think we see like, you know, a lot of like, oh, this is the sex worker movement. Oh, this is the trans movement. Right. And I think that intersectionality gave us like a really good opportunity to like look inside of our own movements and to be like, oh, like, how are we, um, what is it? like reproducing systems of oppressions like within our own movements you know and i think it's like you know a lot of the times that the the most privileged people at the top of these movements are not in community with you know the people at the bottom right i'm not in community with caitlin jenner like she's literally Mm -hmm. out here calling people like me gutter whores and it's like that's not you know like she doesn't speak for me you know and she's actually reproducing a lot of harm um so all that said you know when it when it comes to like my own life my own experiences it's like how, do i know like am i having an intersectional experience right now like you know like <laughs> <laughs> am i facing oppression right now because like this person like knows i'm trans they know i'm asian you know it's like do they know i'm a sex worker it's it's really hard to know mm-hmm. i just i just know like what's going on and that like i live a very complicated life and i'm navigating a lot of things that i don't understand you know mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think that once it's like three identities identities that yeah. you're yeah that's, yeah but that's, I mean there, I also have like certain privileges right and so it's like when I'm like you know in POC you know people of color like communities like being Asian is kind of like you know at the top of you know that um I'm also mm-hmm. half white you know so that's also another thing I'm also just racially ambiguous so I don't know mm-hmm. what's going on half the time <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like am i oppressed right now or not is this person shitty or is they just i don't know who who knows what's ever going on yeah. um but I see- like mm-hmm. interesting i think like one of the things that i'm i feel like i'm hearing you say and i felt this way um in 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 some ways as well is like you can feel like you're um, being oppressed because you're a sex worker or because you're a woman or in your case because you're trans or because you're um you know, um, Asian, but like how it's like hard to pinpoint exactly like what's going on, especially when a lot of the things that people face uh, that we face is like microaggression that isn't so like explicit. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a lot of microaggressions. Right. And then also it's like, we, you know, like when we talk about like discrimination, you know, it's like, no one's going to be like, if they're, if they're smart about it, you know, they're not going to be like, you didn't get this job because you're trans, you, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, they're right. just going to be like, sorry, you know, we, you know, thanks for applying, you know, and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard to know, you know, but it's just like, you know, like we, <sighs> It's like, yes, there's like anti-discrimination laws, but like this so easy. You just have to just not say the, just not say you're discriminating. Like that's the bare right. minimum, you know? Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's always interesting navigating it. Um, and then, you know, it's like a lot of times when I just show up at certain spaces, I'm just like, <sighs> I don't know. I like to keep my cards close, you know? And I just like, you know, it's like, I, I don't, a lot of times, like in my life, like I don't, I don't like to tell people I'm trans until like they've gotten mm-hmm. to know me a bit first. Cause, um, if people just have a lot of preconceived notions about trans women, you know, so it's like, oh, if you get to know me a little bit as a person, right, and you like laugh at like a couple of my jokes first, and then you like see, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and then you learn I'm trans, you know, a little bit later, it's, it's a little bit easier in the process. Um, same yeah. thing with like sex work. I'm just like, you know, if you, you know, if it's if it's one thing of many things, you know, it's yeah. it's not as hard for people to kind of come around and stuff. Um, That's been my experience, mm-hmm. too, because I, I like someone asked me because I am so f- out there as a sex worker, as a digital sex worker, that when I like introduce myself, like, is that the what I say? Like, hi, because you know how people in the yeah. US, especially are so career focused. So like, well, what do you do for work? But <laughs> yeah. I can't I can't lead with that because you're everyone yeah. else is dealing with all their bias. And if I do that, I'm like, I'm pigeonholing myself with this relationship. Yeah. So mm-hmm. like, I can't lead with that. But it's not that I'm ashamed of it. It's that I know we're all carrying all of this, you know, years of societal yeah. brainwashing. And I'm like, I don't want to really ruin a p- potential relationship or friendship with someone where I bring that into the mix too soon. And it's always like, I, it's not from shame. Like it's yeah. not from my shame, but it's from like a, a collective shame. We're all walking around with. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I just yeah. don't want to have to like explain that too. To people what yeah. that means. And I'm not always in the mood to educate <laughs> everyone. <on everything. laughs> I know. So I'm like, I'm, I'm an artist, you know, I, I do this or I model. I don't know. I'm always, I'm always doing different things. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. I'm just kind of making up things as I go. Um, but I think it's <laughs> true, but they don't. They're not helpful. Like, because I'll be like, "Oh, I'm a writer," and they're like, "What do you write about?" And I'm like, "Oh, fuck." Like, <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. That was a bad cover. I'm an yeah. accountant. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of accountants these days yeah. mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> I think too I want to also explore because we've talked a mm-hmm. lot about you know the trans identity but I also want to talk about your Asian identity in, yeah. in that respect too because Asian women especially in porn are so fetishized yes. and I want to touch on that as well what has been your experience yeah so I mean I, I was raised in a mostly just like white like town like I literally everyone was white like for the most part and like I I feel like I I was always very just very confused about my own racial identity you know Mm. and I feel like it's it's so interesting that I am kind of permanently exotic like I I was born in the U.S. I only speak English it's I I literally have like only left the country like twice like I I, like you know it's like I I bring this like exotic you know energy or mystique you know and um I think that's interesting I think that you know like specifically with being trans and Asian I think that you know Asians are kind of seen as like feminine already you know mm-hmm. and that's like a long history of like colonialism mm-hmm. and stuff right but we're already like feminine so it's it's kind of like you know especially like when I was like having a lot of like insecurities about my trans identity and like being feminine it's like being Asian was like definitely helped me like get there and like I I used to like yeah yeah, like my early dating experiences like trying to be a gay boy like being Asian so hard so hard I could not find anyone to date and like now it's like oh we've like flipped and like Asian trans girls are like the thing that like everybody wants um Mm-hmm. And then there's also like, you know, there's like trap fantasy, um, which are just like, you know, um, re- really like passable, um, very feminine, like trans girls are like, no one knows that they're trans type of girls. And like, they're usually Asian. I don't know. It comes from anime. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I fit that category so well. And it's yeah. it's kind of interesting. You know, you just get kind of put into like a fetish category. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I I mean I I I don't know. It's like I think I I think the the thing that's difficult is I feel like people want me to be more Asian than I am. But um, or it's like yeah. you know, and I I think I think a lot of Filipinos specifically. It's like we just I uh, what, what is Filipino? It's like we've been colonized like so many times. It's like we don't you know. I think yeah. being Filipino, not feeling Filipino enough, is a very Filipino feeling. Is what I realized. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I guess that's, yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, it's like when it comes to like being trans and Asian, it's, I don't know. It's, uh, hmm. I don't know. It's like, I I think also people want me to be like very submissive. uh, And that's kind of a stereotype. Um, But it's like, it's also like, I I am a sub. So it's like, (laughs) I'm like, oh no, I'm just like fulfilling stereotypes. But (laughs) But it's okay. (laughs) Um, I think, I don't know. I was like, I think I tried to like resist it. I was like, I'm not a sub. I'm, I'm a big, strong dump. I'm, I'm a sub. Like it's, I I, (laughs) um I'm sorry so (laughs) um yeah 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 Yeah. so do you think that there is like uh, are there things that we didn't ask you about that you think are important when we're thinking about like sex work and like your own experiences of like race and gender you know I just I I love sex workers like so much um and I I think (laughs) that you know out of like a lot of like the organizing communities I've seen, I think that sex worker, I feel like sex workers are so used to being excluded from like so many things, mm-hmm. you know, um, and mm-hmm. ways that we can't help. So I, I feel like it's, it's kind of easy for us to like look at our own community and try to like, you know, like not do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, there's definitely a like, um, uh, you know, and I, I think, and I think this is the other thing is like I think that we we get really wrapped up in like these terms or get really wrapped up like oh this is organizing right, but it's uh, really it comes down to like community, you know, and I feel like, um, you know, like the the trans women of color who are sex workers, like I just I see us like forming community in like such strong ways and like 
you know, and like, it's not out of this, like, you know, oh, I learned about intersectionality, so I'm going to do this. It's just kind of like, it comes naturally, (laughs) you know, and Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I like to remind people that like, you know, it's like, we've been leading revolutions, you know, I think we always forget that Stonewall was started, not just by, you know, trans women of color, but they were also sex workers. And they were also like fighting, you know, anti, you know, prostitution laws. That's what was being specifically used to target them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're still fighting those same laws today and I think that you know it's you know I I think that you know not just be like oh like I have to be intersectional do that but like really build a community form the community don't just invite people to be like on your panels but like invite them Mm -hmm. into your homes have dinner you know give money you know stuff like that you know because if you are doing that kind of community work you're doing that kind of like um, you know, taking care of each other, that type of mutual aid, you know, kind of work, like the intersectionality just comes with that, you know, it's right, not something right. you add on top to your existing work. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things like that sex workers do really, really well is like mutual aid and mm-hmm. community building in a way that I don't see in other communities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else cares about us, so we have to care about us. <laughs> yeah. But, like, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I like what you're saying in terms of like, what do we need to focus on? Not focus on like, oh, we need to have a um, panel that meets this like requirement yeah. of diversity and inclusion or whatever like the buzzwords are. But like instead, like, how do we show community to each other? And Genuinely, then like yeah. you're in relationships with people and that changes everything Mm -hmm. i feel like sometimes the panels and stuff can get so surface like Mm -hmm. in in shallow not shallow in the way we traditionally use the word shallow but in terms of like real community is like Mm -hmm. your neighbor that you care for you watch their kids or you let Mm -hmm. their dog out like the little tiny things that is just like human to human like that's community at its core and like there's a lot of intersectionality and that's going to happen like you said naturally but like let's just all just agree to take care of each other (laughs) (laughs) we do that (laughs) Yeah, it was really, really great to talk to you. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks for having me. Nice yeah, I really you. love your podcast and I'm so excited to be on it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Where can people find you? <laughs> um, yeah, right now, I think Twitter, um, Ember Fiera, um, and also many vids at the moment. And I guess we'll see what else. Um, hopefully, I'll have some more some more avenues for you to give me money um, by the time this comes out. So. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. King Noir is an accomplished and award-winning writer, porn performer, artist, master fetish trainer, MC, and global activist using the proceeds of his album, Music Is My Weapon, to build a school, freshwater well, and medical clinic in guinea Bissau, West Africa. Uh, welcome, King. Thank you for joining us. Peace, peace. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So can you introduce yourself? Yes, I am King Noir. I am half of Royal Fetish Films and Jet Setting Jasmine LLC that I co-own with my partner, Jet Setting Jasmine. I'm a master fetish trainer, uh, athletic, sexual entertainer, and (laughs) (laughs) artist, musician, and overall just uh, here to, to entertain people, educate people, and have a good time. Nice. First, I want to say I love Jasmine. You have like the greatest partner. Um, (laughs) And second, I want to say I want to say I've never heard somebody call themselves an athletic. Wait, wait, how did you say that? (laughs) I don't know. I just made it up. We got to go. We got to rewind it. Uh, No, I mean, I I do think uh, a lot of people overlook the fact that uh, whether it's porn or you know, in-person sex work or stripping or just run down the list of what we do. We are sexual athletes mm-hmm, and yeah. we have to maintain our body. We have to work out wh- whatever, whatever it is that we're doing, you know, not, right. uh, you know, if you're somebody who swallows swords, so to speak, you have to work out your throat. You know what yeah. I mean? If you're going to be <laughs> climbing on the pole, if you're going to be uh, whatever it is that you do, we, we have to be, sexual athletes and I, I think we should be ap- appreciated as such yeah so i mean we wanted to talk to you there's not um there's obviously not as many men in the industry as yeah. there are women so we want to talk to you about your experience as like a male performer but and oh sure. and then also a little bit about like um rate your experience of like racism in the industry um so 
let me actually just start about like being a man in the industry and what that's been like for you and how you kind of got into it. Sure. Uh, I got into it actually uh, when I was 18 years old. I had a homegirl. She was a dancer in Philly and they wanted to take pictures of her. And she was like, I don't want any random dicks in my face. Yeah. She knew that, you know, uh, I need to work. We had already like we messed around. She knew I was an exhibitionist and all that stuff. And she was like, yo, you're looking for work. Come get paid. And that experience was great. It was we didn't even have sex. It was all the like implied stuff, like mm -hmm. all close and all that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. But I, um, the photographer actually asked me, would I be interested in doing some uh I'm trying to think of how they put it, because at the time I didn't know what they were talking about. They're like, they're, there are husbands out there who want to watch people with their wives. Oh, uh -huh. Which yeah. you, you know, kind of like cuck and cuck cuck and, and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But at the time I had no idea really what that was. And I was just mm -hmm. like, I get paid? Sure. <laughs> you know, and that was yeah. how I um I got my start because a lot of people would be like, hey, uh, I'm into getting spanked. I'm into mm -hmm. getting choked. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, I don't know, a dragon tail, all these different things. Yeah. And they were just kind of to a certain extent when I when I was really younger, it was kind of like they were topping from the bottom and just kind of mm. explaining to me yeah. what it was that they liked and and what made them feel good, how to do it safely. And then just kind of started expanding from there to to really getting into into Dom work and mm -hmm. performing on film, doing live sex shows. I, I've done a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, as a man, it's very different because trying to think of the best way to put it like men will reach out to me and say everything you do is fucking cool it's awesome bro but then we'll reach out to the same a woman that does the exact same things as, that i do and be like you're the worst person on the earth you're horrible yeah. you're a whore mm -hmm. you know and it's it's like you can't first of all you shouldn't be putting anybody down for sure. what they want to do and and their choices in life if it's not hurting anybody but you also can't reach out to someone who does the same exact thing just because I have different body parts and say what I'm doing is great and what they're doing is shit. Yeah. You know, so I, I think being in this industry, I've really, really seen firsthand the the differences between how men and women are treated for the exact same shit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like how how we're how we're viewed differently. Um, you know, and men will try women in different ways that they won't try a man you know like what yeah. they'll say um in physical situations like in person situations will try to get different physically not even just putting their hands on somebody but like trying to cut somebody off or impose yeah. their their physicality on somebody whereas you know primarily my clients are women and they're they're not going to try and get over on me in that way yeah. the way yeah. some male clients will do to to women providers so you know hearing stories from women in these situations and also at one point i was actually doing security for women do in 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 person sessions and stuff so it's yeah. like the difference between that person like uh like i know a lot of dancers so people want to book dancers and i would literally just be sitting there to make sure people don't go too far. Mm -hmm. But the conversations that the men who are hiring these dancers would come and have with me and be like, nah, dude, fuck out of here. Don't, don't talk yeah. like that about yeah. her to me. I'm here with them. I'm not here yeah. with them. You know what <laughs> yeah, I'm saying? What, yeah. but, but it's like that, that mentality. So I, I, I think it has provided me with an insight that most people don't get not even just industry wise, but just in how sexuality is viewed, how yeah. sex work is viewed by people yeah. outside of sex work, but just how sex is viewed in general and how mm -hmm. unfortunate it is that men have the opinions that we have is, is pretty shitty. Yeah. Do you feel like having, um, you know, I know you've been in this industry for a long time, but do you feel like having a, um, a life partner that's a sex worker as well has like brought that in to even sharper focus or? Absolutely. And I think it is even more acute because of the work that Jasmine does, mm -hmm. you know, being that being that Jasmine also has blue pearl therapy and she speaks and works with sex workers mm -hmm. directly with things that they're either going through uh, within the industry or with their family because of being in the industry yeah. and all of that. I think, um, you know, I get to listen to her talks or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when, when she does, does, uh, 
outward facing work. Like I'm obviously not there for In her private sessions, calls yeah. and she doesn't <laughs> share her sessions with me. Right. But, um, you know, she, she gets to present this on a larger scale. Like we, we've we done uh, talks with, you know, uh, different organizations and, and, and different uh, schools that actually accredit psychologists to even work with people in our industry. Yeah. And it's just like, it definitely falls in the line of men. We have to do way, 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 way better. We're not, we're not even the, in the ballpark of doing I, <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like just as a, as a whole, there's yeah. so much work that, that men need to do. And, and this also goes for men that are in the industry, you know, um, trying to provide safer spaces and trying to be as good allies as, as humanly possible. Right. Yeah. Whether it be as men or, or, if, or if we're people who have, uh, body parts, but don't identify as male, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, it's important for us to, to stand up for, for those of us who identify as, as, as women. Yeah. I, and now I want to kind of like pivot because we wanted to talk to you about race, but you said something earlier that like actually makes this transition really well. Um, you talked a little bit about, um, cuckolding at the beginning. And one of the things that was, um, surprising to me. I'm embarrassed to say this is surprising to me, but nobody told me about this until I became a sex worker as like just a white woman is like how much white men like eroticize black men sleeping with their, Oh yeah. Um, spouses, wives. their yeah, wives. Spouses. Um, because like sure. I worked on night flirt for years and years and years, I would say that that's the biggest uh, request. request. Yeah, hundred um, percent of my cup holding is that <laughs> scenario. 100%. And I'm wondering if you like want to speak to that, like, and how you feel about how you feel about that, um, about the way that white men um, eroticize black men um, in that way, and what how that's played out in your work. Sure, um, definitely. You know, when I got started, I was a survival sex worker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was I was definitely hired for all kinds of stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I was raised to never let anybody call me certain words or yeah. reference me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So there were definitely incidents where I'd be like, don't ever talk to me like that or I got to leave or, mm -hmm. you know, I I'm not going to say anything that's going to incriminate. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but like, you know, I don't I don't. Um, play that shit, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. um, and then, you know, as I've learned more through the industry, for example, like Queen of Spades. Yeah. Is like the most racist shit. Yeah. But it's it's presented in a way that's like, no, it's somehow empowering. What is the Queen not. of Spades? Um, Queen of Spades is a thing with white women where they say that they only have sex with black men or they're owned by black men sexually. Mm -hmm. okay. And a lot of times but, they have white husbands yeah. and those husbands and, are like in cut cages or whatever. Okay. And the thing is though, calling black people a spade is an incredibly uh, derogatory racial epithet Okay, going okay. back to, to the early 1900s. Um, and I think all of these things are rooted in the same place. So uh, if you go back in American history to slavery, a lot of people, they think, Slavery is presented in, in history books and, and in television through a very narrow scope, usually because the people who produce the films, the people who direct the films don't want to really upset white people too tough. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like this whole argument with critical race theory where people I, I, it's a whole other thing. But yeah. really, if you don't want if you don't want true history taught the people who don't want it taught is because they're ashamed of how fucked up yeah. the history. Is. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So the, the racial, the, the idea of black super potent sexuality mm -hmm. comes from a couple of places in our history. One from the fact that white men would rape everybody. White men would yeah. rape black women on the plantation. White men would rape black men on the plantation. Mm -hmm. There's something that's called buck breaking where groups of white men would go from plantation to plantation and rape black men who they considered to be, uh, insubordinate or unruly wow. and it was yeah. a form of punishment um and as a way to kind of like shame them mm -hmm. in front of everybody because usually these things would happen in front of the entire plantation mm -hmm. uh 
So that's that's one side of things. The other side of things was um, plantations in America. Like we always are taught about cotton, uh, sugar cane, rice, all these things that that made America uh, super rich. Yeah. But when you look at Virginia, which was, you know, like the seat of uh, of the Confederacy, um, the largest plantations and the most profitable plantations in Virginia were actually uh, human farms mm -hmm. where they would force people to have sex and and breed. They, they were breeding farms. Mm -hmm. So there was this idea of black male sexual dominance or superiority in a, in a sense, because they would literally force children, you know, teenagers to have a certain amount of babies before they reached a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, I can actually get you. I have all of these numbers written up, Jasmine, and I actually do a, um, a, a talk on this. I can get you all those numbers as well. Um, but so because of that, you know, a lot of the uh, like when you think of a lot of these stereotypes of mm -hmm. black people sexually, they derive from forced actions. Right. Like forced. And when I say forced, I mean forced like they would kill you or if you were a man and you didn't produce a certain amount or a boy at that age yeah. um, and didn't produce a certain amount of children, you'd be castrated. Wow. Um, I, if you were a, like a lesson for if, me. Because, wow. If you were if you were a young girl and you didn't produce a certain amount of children by a certain age, you would uh, be forced off of that a breeding farm to whatever kinds of extreme manual labor in the rice plantation or the cotton field or, or sugar plantation, depending on where you lived in the country. Right. They also set up like a uh, matrilineal, like servitude statues too. So that like, whatever, whoever the, whatever the race of the mother is like, that's the um, status of okay. like the kids, because the idea was then like the white men weren't responsible for it, like, raping all yeah. of the yeah well in, in america they also had the 1 16th um mm -hmm. if you had 1 16th black blood then you were considered black in america which is why like when you go to other places in the country if you're mixed i mean on other places in the world if you're mixed they consider you like mixed or this or that or the other but in america you're still considered black mm -hmm. um another place that it came from was because of the amount of rape that white men and it isn't just plantation mm -hmm. owners it wasn't just overseers white men period yeah would just rape black people mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like you would there, there it it was a power structure that wasn't just owners like a lot of people try to make this conversation like my family didn't own slaves so we had nothing to do with it no it was a complete power structure that was based on race across the board so the amount of white men, especially that rape black women, there was a fear that, right, like, this is going to happen to us at some yeah. point. Because yeah. also within the same oppression that was forced upon black people, white men opp oppressed black, I mean, white men oppressed white women by not allowing white women to be a part of certain power structures as well. So they had to put, you know, like the Southern Bell. Yeah, yeah. Pedestal. Mm -hmm. So you look at a black man, you talk to a, to a black man, you know, he's going to be killed or whipped, but you're also going to be beaten. Yeah. You sleep with a black man, you're ostracized. You're going to receive that scarlet letter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that fear um, started really coming out in, in American, uh, American culture through books like Mandingo, which yeah. we see now in porn, you know, oh, like yeah. the labels of Mandingo yeah. and things like that. Really, there's a tribe in Africa called Mandinka, but it's a whole different thing, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and just for people listening, Black men, just like all men in the world, have big dicks, little dicks, medium dicks, yeah. fat dicks, skinny dicks, <laughs> curved dicks, straight dicks, like it, it, it ranges, right? But because of that fear of, of, of retaliation, all these other things kind of come into to people's minds. So um, like the book Mandingo was about this slave owner that, you know, had a baby with a black woman on the plantation. And when he left, he was afraid that this slave name, named Mandingo was going to fuck his wife. Mm -hmm. Right. So that that became like a big thing. And then if you think uh, the first ever 
what's considered a blockbuster film in America was uh, Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation was by D.W. Griffin, and basically they made the Ku Klux Klan the heroes, and the bad people in the movie were the freed, freed Black folk who were played by white folk in blackface. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason the Ku Klux Klan was the heroes was to stop them from raping white women. Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. It's the same thing. Fast forward hundreds of years to Trump scaring people and saying Mexicans coming across the border are rapists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. like one of those things to like yeah. rile up the people against Frankenstein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it's played out in porn because there are a lot of taboos that people are like, oh, shit, I can make money off of that. Yeah. yeah. So it's been played up in porn really heavy since like the 70s and 80s and 90s. Is like there are very few black performers. But then, you know, primarily the black men would shoot with white women, mm -hmm. you know, especially especially like in the 80s and 90s, where, you know, it was hard for black folk to find black porn <laughs> that yeah. was just black people you know what i'm saying you would have to go and find something called interracial and even the the labeling mm -hmm. interracial primarily maybe up until last summer mm -hmm. interracial <laughs> meant black man yeah. white woman right. it didn't matter mm -hmm. if you were asian mm -hmm. latina latino yeah. whatever nope black man white woman because right. of that same fixation mm -hmm on 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 it and also you know up until maybe last summer also white women would choose would choose to charge more money to shoot scenes yeah, with black yeah. men mm -hmm. even if all the white men they fuck had bigger dicks that one black man's dick would be perceived as ruining them mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying or like you look at uh companies blacked mm -hmm. what does it mean to be blacked you're yeah. stained, you're soiled. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's a derogatory term that mm -hmm. definitely was around before porn. And now it's being profited. Um, it's it's being used for profit. And it's also trying to make it seem as if it's OK and it's mainstream. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, as if it's accepted or acceptable. I, I worked with somebody. Well, one of the agencies that I was on maybe like five or six years ago. Um, there was a performer. I'm not going to say her name. She's no longer in the industry. Um, we had shot something together mm -hmm. and she directed it. It was super dope. Beautiful. <laughs> but then she signed a contract with Black and Black said, you cannot release that because we want it to make to make it seem that your first Black experience is with Black. You know what I'm saying? And that's, yeah. that's super dehumanizing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's very dehumanizing yeah. to go about it that way. Like, and you're not a person that she, like, she has to pretend that you didn't exist and yeah. you didn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, but, and, and, but also in the sense of, like, dehumanizing to her within the sense of the people that you choose to sleep with or the people you choose to film with, um, they are, are only regulated to their skin color because yeah. they didn't care that she fucked however many non-black yeah. people that she yeah. fucked, but only that, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So it's, it's, it's very, very, uh, and it's still, it's still prominent in our industry. Now, I think there are a couple, you know, a couple of companies who are like, Oh shit, this shit is fucking racist. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> maybe try to change, mm -hmm. change some of their imagery. But for the most part, you know, AVN, XBiz, they still reward people for putting out films that are queen or king of spades and all kinds of shit like that. It's, it's pretty disgusting, actually. It's like one of those things where it's like. White people be like, why does everything have to be about race? Mm -hmm. And black people, we feel the same fucking way. Yeah. Except mm -hmm. you're annoyed by it we're held back by it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. a whole different thing. It's like, I don't want to fucking have to talk about race all the time. I would love to be able to get into some place and, and, and have my merit and, and mm -hmm. my, my past work yeah. be what someone's looking at, you know, mm -hmm. you know, not my, not my skin color. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I want to, uh, 
like I was just thinking about this. I want to have you back on sometime to talk about something that's not right. I was going to say, can we apologize <laughs> formally because we are clearly two white women a part of the problem. Um, but yeah. I would love to talk to you about master fetish training. I would yes. love to talk to you about erotic massage. Absolutely. I would love to talk to you about your art. So um, we need to do this again, but I also like really, really value the work that you're doing. And, um, and also and- the education you just gave me. Cause like I, I, absolutely got the textbook history version of slavery. So this was enlightening and I have a ton of work to do, which this podcast teaches me with every fucking guest that comes on. Honestly. So um, I just wanted to say, appreciate that. Oh, I, I'm, I just got excited when you said, you know, I, I have some books that I would love to recommend to you. Absolutely. And if you want to, if y'all are yeah. cool with, uh, I don't know, putting in a description for. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Say them and we'll keep them in. Yeah. This book, I'm, um, it's serious. I'm, I'm working my way through it now. It's called The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery in the Making of American Capitalism. And oh, it, wow. talks, it talks a lot about the uh, like the breeding plantations that I was mm-hmm. speaking about mm-hmm. earlier. Um, and it also talks about the fact that America became rich because of slavery, mm-hmm. not because of what slavery produced, but, but specifically because of slavery. Yeah. Because at one point, my ancestors were worth more than all of the gold that America had within its possession. Wow. Worth more than the land that we worked. Mm-hmm. So that's that's very important to know because yeah. America worked with banks in Europe and took out bonds on people. And those that's were matched so by some of the bonds in like all the old uh, yeah. all the old banks from Europe. They might have stopped. uh trading slaves, but they were willing to put bonds on, on humans. And then the other book is birthing a slave motherhood and medicine in the antebellum South. I think this is a very important book to read as well, because seen that. uh Because this one also speaks about when, when we talk about how black women are treated across the board, this book uh, speaks about a lot of that, like the, the mammyisms, the idea that, uh, you know, black women aren't to be to be treated with with any kind of doubt, um, with any kind of respect. Mm-hmm. And it also talks about the doctor, like modern gynecology was started by a white doctor who experimented on black women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, it talks about that as well. So like those two books, I, I think, directly uh, speak to some of the. Uh, some of the stereotypes that we do wind up seeing in porn and, and sexuality as a, as a whole in America. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We should probably wrap up, but is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would love to get across in this interview or things that you're plugging or anything? Yeah, for sure. I, I would like to wrap up by saying everybody is beautiful and our cultures and our differences are things that we can find attractive in people, but should mm-hmm. not be fetishized. Mm-hmm. If, if, if that mm-hmm. makes sense, like, you know, we, we all have things that make us individuals, wh- whether it's, you know, from the food we eat to the way we dance, to the way we move, to the way we talk. All these mm-hmm. things are beautiful things and they should be shared amongst one another. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, but don't fetishize somebody only for that. Learn about who they are as an individual and a person. And that mm-hmm. makes them even sexier. Mm-hmm. Um, besides that, please go to Royal Fetish XXX.com, King Noir XXX.com, and bust all kinds of nuts and, and rub one out <laughs> to, to Royal Fetish and all the amazing sex that we have. That's, awesome. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you want to uh, see your socials as well? Yes, yes. Um, I'm shadow banned on everything, but you can find me <laughs> at K I N G N O I R E on Twitter, The Real King Noir on Instagram. And yeah, hit me up and, and enjoy what we do. And I would love to come back and talk about all the other things as well. And But I do abri- appreciate y'all uh, having me on for this topic. I know it's not an easy one, but it's definitely a. a well, I appreciate one. you wanting to come on and talk about it with us. Yeah. And next time, kink and massage yeah (laughs) sounds more fun (laughs) dulciana beatrix is an erotic multimedia artist dominatrix and zen buddhist monastic she has been a sex worker since 2015 welcome um can you introduce yourself to our audience we're really happy to talk to you today okay so um i am 
I'm a religious worker. Uh, I am a Zen Buddhist nun. Uh, I was a monastic living in the mountains for eight years. And my work uh, in sex work and also in creating erotic art is heavily influenced by that. It's heavily influenced by my Japanese culture and my upbringing. Um, my experience as a Zen Buddhist nun in a really formal uh, and strict and intense Japanese environment. Um, I started when I was in my early twenties. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because when I started, so you spent, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you spent most yeah. of your twenties in a monastery. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Eight That's years so from wild. like from yeah. 24 to 31 or 32. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, um, so all my life, cause I'm half Japanese and half white Greek, Ukrainian white. Mm -hmm. So, um, I always felt this kind of, um, cultural identity crisis. I call mm -hmm. it, um, my in my home and in my upbringing like the greco-ukrainian sides were there there was that influence but um in terms of um the, just the largest presence obviously was japanese from my mother mm -hmm. from like her cooking from her being connected to our relatives in japan from watching japanese tv shows all the time um and exposing me as a kid i mean through we did we took trips to japan um me they sent me to Princeton to learn the language for three oh, years wow. um, as like a, you know, um, I, I guess I was like in my early teens. It was like an extracurricular kind of thing. Like oh, Princeton yeah. had this special, you know, program. Yeah. Um, I did that. And um, so uh, the influence on my life is huge. There's good aspects and bad aspects to it. Um, there is no governing body of Buddhism, like the Vatican or whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. um, and that means, and also in Asia, there's so many different sects and so many different styles. So there's yeah. Zen in Japan, but there's also like Vietnamese style. There's you know, in, and mm -hmm. the way Buddhist practice looks uh, and and is um, lived out um, culturally. Um, in Southeast Asia versus China versus Japan, it looks so different. What I'm trying to say is, you know, if you've seen the documentary on Netflix, The Wild Wild Country about the Rajneeshis, they're also, um, their I teachers called them. Osho. I know about them, yeah. It's like when you have this teacher and that teacher from this tradition and that tradition, and there's no... Um, group that's really yeah. or system of checks and balances yeah. and this mm -hmm. is in the 1960s 1970s and it, free love and whatever mm -hmm. there's gonna be sexual misconduct there's gonna be all kinds of mess happening how did you i'm curious because i'm not as familiar with you and i'm uh, some of our listeners won't be as well how did you end up leaving that life and get, getting involved in sex work um long story short is i got knocked up <laughs> I, yeah um and it was also a, a kind of a weird thing because like we had been transitioning out of one era of like really bad secretive sexual misconduct okay. and we were under new leadership and there's a new teacher and it's like there's a new era of transparency and so while I was there my relationship was kind of held up as like a pillar of like transparent like this is an example of what a good relationship can be that can happen yeah. here because we were trying to say like you know obviously when you say, you know, no fraternization and no sex and no this and no that, like it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all around. Mm -hmm. Of course, I participated in my share of dalliances. Practice. And I had a rule for me. My rule was just like, keep it off the mountain. Like what mm -hmm. I do on my vacation time off the mountain is my business. And I like that because I kept it so clean. And then mm -hmm. I could divorce myself from that, go back to my practice and not have all of that, yeah. like, you know, nonsense getting in my yeah. way, like guys calling me and what about this? One? No, it's just like, if I have a brief time, like a furlough or family time or, you know, approved time off, then like I could do whatever I want during that time and just keep it, you know, just keep it discreet and keep it clean. And then yeah. like, yeah. So the one time that I decide to break my rule and get involved with someone, you know, within the community out in the open, like it, it turned into um, a pregnancy. And <laughs> anyway, so, um, so that happened. 
And then while I was, you know, transitioning um, out of that monastic life so that I could take care of my baby, my mom got ill with cancer. I ended up um, doing kind of by default, um, falling into a situation where I was solely doing domestic unpaid labor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And I, I was taking care of my mom and that was fine because it's just like I had a baby and, uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, first of all, the, it was great because, you know, for the for the first two years of my child's life, my mom was so present in her yeah. life. Yeah. And so, um, but my focus um, was purely on doing that, but it's just like, oh, well, I used to have a career before yeah. I was a nun. I used to yeah. work as a fashion industry executive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, well, I can't go back and get a job as long as my mom needs all this ca- constant care. Yeah, yeah. And so um, the, all of the kind of more sort of traditional or like, you know, working mother mm-hmm. options that are open to people that are trying to get back into the workplace. Like those yeah. options were not available to me. Then after my mother passed away, here's my dad, uh, widowed, disabled, and unable to take care of himself. And it's just yeah. like, okay, so I guess I'm really not going anywhere. Um, yeah. And then so, you know, sex work uh, was something that I started to do on the side. I'm curious. So so you got into sex work. That makes a lot of sense to me because I kind of got into sex work as a caretaker too. But like, um, how do you... Um, how you're talking about the fact that like your, your Japanese heritage and being like, um, part Asian, like impacted your life and your career, but how has it impacted you in sex work? And like, what do you see in sex work, um, in terms of like how your, um, actually going back to your idea of being like a projection, like what is now projected onto you, like in the sex work realm? (laughs) It, it, you know, when you're a kid, at first it's just like, you know, insults about like slanty eyes, ching chong, ching chong. But mm-hmm. then eventually, when you get older, it starts to get a little sexual. Now, mm-hmm. 1987, Full Metal Jacket comes out. And, uh, you know, it's an R rated movie. And none of my classmates obviously saw it, but it introduced to pop culture the phrase, me so horny, me love you long time in that famous scene where, yeah. I, you know, um, just for those who don't know, it's um, a film set in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And there's a very famous scene where a prostitute, you know, saunters up to American GIs and offers herself. And she says, you know, five dollars, sucky, sucky. You know, I, I please you all night long. Me, me love you long time. And so that happened. But then two years later, Two Live Crew takes that sample and turns it into a hugely popular rap song. Then yeah. everybody knows it because it's all over the radios. And so yeah. it's like 1989. I'm in fourth grade or fifth grade. And then mm-hmm. in fifth grade, instead of just like ching chong, ching chong, fu man, shoe jokes, it's me so horny, me love you long time. Like, you know, older kids started saying yeah. it to me. And I'm like, yeah, God, what the fuck? Like, that's fucking gross, right? Yeah, that's so, just being, like, so I have to actually, actually, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, but like, you know, because of the rap song, it became so ubiquitous in popular culture. And, you know, when you watch the video, the video itself is actually not sexualizing Asian women. Um, Like the rappers are most of the dancers are black women. I think there's like one or two white women in there. Um, So like the video itself and the song itself is not fetishizing Asian women. But it took that scene from Full Metal Jacket became one of the most popular samples or notorious samples in hip hop of that time. And even people who don't know the song know that line yeah, because they, yeah. they say it all the time. And so like, finally, when I'm a teenager, it's like, I can't walk down the street with someone saying me so horny. And it's just like, Oh my God. God, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, can you just go back to calling me an egg roll and can we call it a day? Like, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so there's that. Then when I'm in high school, um, I hear on classic rock radio the David Bowie song China Girl for the first time. Mm-hmm. And uh, wow, uh, it's, it, I felt like I had to take a shower after hearing that song. Um, If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you go look it up on YouTube. It has an 
awesome accompanying video um, where it's just like there's a lot of sexualization. David Bowie basically has a young Chinese girlfriend who was his girlfriend in real life. She was 23. She was a model. She's from New Zealand. And he actually like set up an apartment in Sydney so that they could see each other all the time. Wow. And it, he, now China girl was like hot off of let's dance and let's dance is also known as a very like anti-racist anthem. The video, like he specifically went out of his way to hire um, indigenous dancers, black dancers. Yeah. So everyone was like, David Bowie's not racist. He's a good guy. He's making songs that are against racism. And so when you go and you watch China girl on YouTube, you look under all the comments, and they're like all, all of the comments are just talking about what a great song it is first of all um and then like you will have like paragraphs by like white guys defending david bowie going well actually this song isn't racist he's critiquing the orientalism of the area and he's saying that colonialism is bad actually and i'm just like well actually okay <laughs> yeah the, the thing is Yes, it is true that the song is a critique on colonialism. However, like, who authorized the Thin White Duke to be the educator? <laughs> like, to, the thing is, yeah. is like they say, oh, the way he presented it in the video was too subtle. It went over people's heads. Is it really that subtle if you're recreating that famous image of a Vietnamese man getting his brains blown out at point blank with a gun? Like, you know, that famous bit or, or, or like Napalm Girl. Um, like, and also, too, these are horrific images from Vietnam and the song is China Girl. Like, come on. Can you yeah, like yeah, tidy yeah. it up a little bit? But, um, but the thing is, everyone's just like, well, but Bowie's intentions were good. His intentions were good. But the thing is, is like... The song is still really sexy and the video is also really sexy. So even if it's a critique on racism and it's a critique on Orientalism and whatever, it's still like very sexy. much like, yeah. yeah. It, and and uh, it, it's, it's hard to stomach, honestly, yeah, as an Asian yeah. woman to watch that. It's mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. And, you know, so this is the thing. You know, uh, Do you think you fetishize more in the civilian world than in your sex work? It's possible that that's true, especially now. Mm -hmm. But it's more like um, it's weaponized against me, as usual, like if I reject a client. Like I – there's someone – in May that I turned down because I'm not doing person to person work at this time. Um, and like, I'm still getting texts saying like you ching chong go like I, you caused coronavirus, go eat some bat, like horrible, horrible yeah, things. It's just like, yeah. wow. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, there's a lot of, I think <sighs> people fall back on retaliatory violence. And so um, I don't think that anyone, um, again, who is familiar with my work, yeah. um, zeroes in on like, oh, I want like a Japanese geisha or this or that. Um, but um, if I don't act the way that they expect me to act yeah. or if I don't provide, you know, the attitude yeah. that they expect yeah. from me, um, then it quite fr fr uh, frequently can devolve into like retaliatory racism. Yeah. I think that what you brought up too about, uh, I, I'm curious how, have you seen more of that because of COVID? Like what you mentioned about them bringing like COVID and, and coronavirus into that. Has there been a huge uptick in that now? because of the circumstance of I feel pandemic. like I get it all the time. I got it all the time before the pandemic, but I think it, like the pandemic made it an even more popular cheap shot. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, yeah, and uh as in like, you know, if you're <laughs> if I'm walking down the street and someone doesn't have a mask on and I kind of go like yeah. I go like this. <laughs> away from them <laughs> then they'll be like fuck you ching chong covid like it's like covid kind of has a, like a morphed or evolved into an anti-asian slur so now it's just like shut up covid like covid is just like saying chink you know what i mean it's it's you know anyway yeah, be, yeah. but it's it's become mm -hmm. a very handy and easy cheap shot that people have in immediate reach oh, you know 
Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, something I wanted to bring up, um, while we're talking about like, you know, fetish, fetishization of Asian culture, um, and how it permeates the sex work world. Let's talk about Kim Anami. She is the Kung Fu vagina lady. She's a white lady and she is a white lady sexual healer educator. Basically, she like, you know, is shilling the jade eggs and the yoni exercises and whatever. First of all, her name, Anami, like she, she, she kind of co-opted for herself an Indian name because you know how when like white ladies get their yoga teacher certification, suddenly they're like, I'm a Shanti. And it's like, you're Susan. (laughs) <laughs> but, but you know what I mean yeah. so, so she she's a you know a white lady who gave herself an Indian name and she just said I'm a sexual health educator so one of the wow. things she teaches is like you know basically she gives glorified online Kegel seminars but she's like wow. namaste we will put the jade egg in your yoni and this is kung fu vagina and so if she wow. I, I do not know about this I I'll send you <laughs> I'll send you a couple of um, Daily Mail hit pieces on her that I may or may not have tipped off a journalist to. <laughs> um, because, well, there was a journalist who was already covering it. And then this Kim Anami woman, she's just like a horrible, grotesque individual. Um, she doubled down on it. And she's oh, just wow. like, oh, me so sorry. Me hurt your feelings. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, she goes, you sensitive snowflakes hated my Kung Fu vagina video. Well, too bad. Eh. And she's just like oh, a really God. revolt vile, ugly yeah. white lady. And, um, but so, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are really upset by her content and it's just yeah. like, you know, just as a sexual educator, cause the, she, her Kung Fu vagina, um, vid, it was like a parody music video and it's okay. like a takeoff of the song Kung Fu fighting. And so yeah. of course it uses that, uh, you know, stereotypical Chinese musical motif. That's like, right and it's like very it's gross and again you know she's using um she's a white lady but she has asian women in her video also that are like and it's like oh my god like it's fucking 2021 like why are people still doing this um and uh so so she got some pushback and then she just Mm -hmm. didn't care and she doubled down on everything and she's gross and i want to end her so yeah (laughs) we will keep that in yes Yes, absolutely please please i think we we she knows she knows that i have a vendetta against her she knows like she blocked me on everything i don't care i don't care like the next time i see her i'm gonna call up my daily mail uh connect and be like she's at it again so yeah Mm -hmm. she can come after me i don't care her trolls can come come for me kim (laughs) i'm ready Love this. Uh, yeah, we actually have to like wrap this up to keep like on mm. our schedule for today. But this is amazing. Yeah, this was so amazing. I really in- like, appreciate everything that you've said. Yeah. And also the fact that you told us so much of the fetishiza- fetishization before sex work and like your personal experience, like going to school and being so young, yeah. like that really is going to resonate, I think, with a lot of people mm-hmm. um, that are listening into this. And obviously that's something that we can't provide any any yeah. uh, perspective on. So like that's that's so. Important. But you're yeah. giving me and also the other guests in the show a chance to share these experiences, and that's important. You know, it's just like maybe maybe no one's gonna change anyone's minds. Like I'm I'm not necessarily trying to change anyone's mind, but it's just like if someone is listening and they're like, oh yeah, maybe I made a joke against my coworker. And it's kind of yeah. gross. Like, you know, like if it causes people to kind of, you yeah. know, maybe think a little That's bit flat. deeper yeah. or kind of second guess their behavior. Like, because again, so much of it too, they're microaggressions. So it's just like, oh, but it was just a, co- you have beautiful eyes. It's a compliment. And it's like, you know, so maybe yeah, it'll yeah. just get people to cultivate a little more sensitivity. I actually loved how you like interwove, um, pop culture history with your yeah, own that was timeline really cool. was really like actually this history that you gave like of these like songs and movies and how this impacted like your own life story is like so useful to that yeah. because I think I have to say like 
the miso horny thing, it's like a plague. And any woman of my generation of like, you know, we can all relate to it because I don't think that there's an Asian woman who hasn't walked down the street and heard someone scream that at her. It's yeah, such that's a so common important. experience. I think it's so important. So I really yeah. appreciate you telling yeah. that story. Um, where can people find you and your work? Oh, um, I am. I'm on Twitter. I'm almost always shadow banned, but I am on Twitter at cloisterfuck. My Instagram is transcendent brutality, and those are probably the two platforms that I'm on the most. I'm here and there, elsewhere, but like me alone i just want to hide under my rock and be a (laughs) but yeah just follow me on twitter where i shoot my mouth off and uh on instagram where i post crazy nail pictures and fetishes (laughs) yeah it was really really good to talk to you thank Thank you you so much that was a lot that was a lot i just got schooled yeah, I know. <laughs> and also, <laughs> wow, how did how hard did we walk into to what King Noir said about having? I know he was like, I don't want to just do interviews on my race, and I was like, oh, sorry, we have we to do are about your the problem. Race. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Um, wow. No, and I totally understand that because there's this way in which, like, I mean, we had that with other guests too, yeah. who were like, I want to come in your show, but I don't want to talk about race or I don't want to talk about gender or like the thing that I get asked to talk about a lot and. I get that perspective and I totally appreciate it, respect it. And on the other hand, like I don't want to ignore like race when we're talking about the industry because we know racism is a, is a, is a problem here. Yeah. But I also don't want to speak about racism when like I am the problem in a racist culture and not the like uh, on the receiving end of and it. We're not so, qualified. Yeah. 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 I agree. So, and the gender conversations were really interesting as well. I mm-hmm. really love what Dulcinea said and how she, how she brought pop culture into the timeline of the discussion. Yeah, yeah. That really, like, I, I don't remember seeing those movies or hearing those songs, but mm-hmm. I know that reference. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I do. And I think we're like roughly probably the same age, which is probably why that resonated a lot with me. But I am familiar with it, but have not done like the level of thinking about it that she has. Yeah. And I, um, so appreciate having that brought to my attention. I mean, I never thought that that was like a positive. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Thing. It was never a good thing. Yeah, but I don't, but I didn't think about like how that would have impacted like um, girls my age who were Asian. And so I think that it was like really great to have that sort of perspective yeah. and um, that everybody brought and that Ember brought about like mm-hmm. being both trans and Asian and how that impacts um, the work that she does and how she's taken up in the industry. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And it, it's great to have qualified people on to come and talk about this stuff and also yeah. to give our audience maybe some shared perspective that they may or may not have experienced as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I said to Noir when we were in the interview with him is that as like a phone sex operator, I got hit so often with, um, um, BBC cuckolding fantasies mm-hmm. um, that that's like so much so entrenched in our, in our culture. And there's so much anxiety around black men from white men that yes. I did not know about before I got into I mean I maybe knew about it like I knew that that existed mm-hmm. and when he gave us like a history of like Mandingo I, I understand that mm-hmm. I know like what that is but being in this world and hearing like white men over and over again talk about this anxiety that they have about like black dicks mm-hmm. and what black men are going to do to their wives and let me first qualify by saying like I actually don't participate in like in the fetishization of like black male bodies yeah. in that way but that doesn't mean that I haven't been asked, asked to do so yeah. over and over and Constantly. over again and because it's so much a part of like porn culture. And um, and and I really appreciated what King did to say like, yes, this is like a big part of our culture and this is where it started, mm-hmm. you know, and take us through like the history of how black bodies are interpreted in our culture. Um, and also the bonus of recommending educational reading to yeah. our fans to mm-hmm. also come along on this journey with me, at least to, to learn yeah. about these things that I was not even familiar with. Yeah. So yeah, the, the wisdom that like all three of our guests brought, I think was really, really insightful for, 
for for me and I hope for the audience as well. <laughs> Especially for me. So this is another episode of Mel getting schooled on the horizon. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. This was great. No, that's what we want, actually. Yeah. And I mean we said that at one of the at one on um, maybe that was the first episode where we said like we actually want to bring in people who don't just like echo our beliefs yeah, or exactly. um um, we want to be challenged. We want to be expanded. We want to learn along, you know, because we're we're facing our own bias. You right. know, I'm coming mm-hmm. into a lot of these interviews really having to reflect and challenge things I've been taught or I've grown up believing right. or the experiences I've had, which is the whole point. And that's what we want our viewers to experience as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. So being challenged, um, realizing that we I'm like being told fairly directly that we're like part of the problem (laughs) was hard to hear. But at the same time, I was like, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Like, I appreciate that people trust us enough to, or I hope that people trust us enough to tell us when we're a part of the problem, when we're doing things that aren't right. Or when we can be doing things better. Like we're trying to establish the safe space for everyone to come on and speak frankly. Um, because that's kind of something that's missing right now is mm-hmm. honest discord about these hard topics, especially yeah. when things are so amplified in our social climate. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, um, I really appreciate all of the guests that came on and mm-hmm. that talked about, you know, talked about their truths and, and it's hard topics. Yeah. On hard topics. So, so thank you. And thank you for listening. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us for another episode of On the Horizon, a podcast about what's on the horizon for sex workers and how to navigate it. I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual and at jessiesage.com. And I am Melrose Michaels, and you can find me at Melrose Michaels on social and at melrosemichaels.com. Remember, if you want bonus footage from today's episode, you can always subscribe to us on Anchor for $9.99 a month to access all the footage we couldn't include on today's show. Thank you.